Okay, hello everyone. Um, welcome to the fifth installment of OFE's Open Source Policy Series. I am Paula Grzegorzewska and I am a policy advisor at Open Forum Europe. Let me first say a couple words of introduction and present our speakers and then we can follow up with the presentations. So I guess most of you know us, uh, but for those who don't, uh, Open Forum Europe is a Brussels-based think tank working at the intersection of open technologies and public policy. Uh, so specifically for this event, uh, we know that there have been vast developments in the open source hardware ecosystem in recent years in terms of technology, collaboration between different actors, emergence of new players and business models. With this event, we want to understand more about the challenges, about the opportunities and good examples that can be followed in order to reap benefits of this growing trend for the benefit of European businesses and citizens. Certainly, there is a reason why we talk more about open hardware. With the increased focus on technological independence, we need to think about all layers of the technological landscape, including the most fundamental digital infrastructure elements. Open hardware already today is implemented in many technologies, products and services, including 3D printing, maker spaces where a global movement, uh, as well as global movements to develop open designs for medical appliances and ventil ventilators during the pandemic, uh, but also many other services and products. Um, recently, we have seen the chip shortages in the automotive sector, and this has proven Europe's dependence in the area of sem semiconductors. Uh, moreover, the European Commission identified 137 product, uh, product dependencies with, uh, products with significant dependencies in the, in the recent industrial strategy in the most sensitive ecosystems. And also the study that we have conducted on the impact of open source software and hardware has shown that there are significant gaps in policy thinking and research on the impact of open source hardware. Open chips can be one of the critical components of a digitally sovereign technology landscape, and there is a need to discuss it more on the European level. So we will start this event with a few words from Rick O'Connor, president and CEO at the Open Hardware Group, partner of the sponsor of the OFE Open Source Policy Series, the Eclipse Foundation. We are thankful for their support, enabling us to put this series of events on. Then we will have Andrew Katz, partner at Moorcrafts LLP and the co-author of our study on the impact of open source software and hardware, who will present key concepts and definitions useful for discussing open source hardware. After that, we will hear from Javier Serrano from CERN, um, who will be discussing, um, who will present a talk on combining the commons and commercial activity in public-private partnerships. Next, we'll have a short Q&A with the first two panelists. And after that, in the second part of the event, We'll have Zvonimir Bandic, who is a senior director at Western Digital and the chairman of Chips Alliance, who will discuss how open hardware can be a part of a successful business strategy. And then we will hear from Kalista Redmond, CEO at the Risk Five International. Uh, unfortunately, Kalista wasn't able to join us today as she is currently on the plane, uh, but she pre-recorded her speech, so uh, we will be able to, uh, you know, to hear her contribution to the discussion. Uh, and we will finish with uh, yet another Q&A to answer any remaining questions and maybe have some follow-up discussion. So just a bit of housekeeping before we get started. We want this policy series to be a space for open exchange and we are very happy to take questions from the audience. If you'd like to ask a question, please write it in the chat or use the ask question feature in Crowdcast. Please also take note that this event, like all OFE activities, is covered by the OFE Community Participation Guidelines, which you can read on our website. And a reminder, this event is being recorded and will be shared on our channels afterwards. So uh, now, without, uh, without further ado, I would like to invite uh, Rick O'Connor uh, on screen. Okay, perfect. Hi, Paula. Hello. Okay. I'm minimizing myself and the floor is yours. All right. I've got a good echo uh, going on here. I'd... All right. I'm, oh, I'm hoping you can. Uh, s s hmm. Yes, we can see it well. Is there an echo for you? For you? No, it, uh, it works well. We All see right. it. OK, so I'm going to give a, a, a brief um, overview of, of some of the challenges and topics associated with open source hardware. And as Paula said, what this what this discussion is about is the semiconductor open source uh, activities. And people think of hardware as everything from, like Paula said, 3D, 3D printing, 
uh, the enclosures associated with uh, electronic systems, uh, big racks, you know, the, the, the mounting screws, so, you know, that's all hardware. And what, what specifically we're talking about is the semiconductor industry and digital assets uh, and analog assets uh, around creating an open source ecosystem and, and the challenges associated with that. So I'm with the Open Hardware Group, an international organization, uh, 70 members and partners strong today. Uh, and we are partnered with the Eclipse Foundation, uh, working to deliver open source artifacts into the industry. So let's start by taking a, a look at the challenges associated with chip development, and uh, namely the cost, right? This is a heavy uh, OPEX and CAPEX investment for all forms of semiconductor development. Uh, older technology nodes obviously have lower costs associated with them, but in a current deep submicron technology node, uh, like at the 12 LP or, and, and seven nanometer space, you know, we're talking about tens of billions uh, of, of, of dollars for development uh, for a large scale SOC. And the majority of that work uh, is around the verification, the, SS, the design work itself and the physical design work uh, on top of, of that SOC. Um, and if you add in the software associated with that IP, uh, uh, then we're looking at 90% of the development cost is tied up in those areas. And this is certainly warranted for highly differentiated IP that, that brings new, you know, innovative features and functionality. But for general purpose IP, we could do better and we should do better by sharing uh, these development costs through reuse across in the industry. Okay, so that sounds lovely, uh, but what these, uh, with an industry that has had a history of such heavy CapEx uh, investments in order to play, there are very, very deep patent portfolios associated with all of the, uh, the collateral, if you will, or the IP stack required to deliver high-end chips. And there's three significant barriers to adoption that, that we need to be good at in terms of overcoming these barriers and, and nurturing an open source development community. The first is the quality of the IP. Uh, if, if you've got a, a huge $50 million investment in an SOC, are you going to risk that investment as, as a large chip manufacturer by integrating an IP block that you downloaded off a repo on, on a website someplace? Uh, maybe not. Um, and, and even if you do convince yourself you can do this, how are you going to convince yourselves you got a roadmap um, and all the necessary support from an ecosystem perspective to, uh, in support of that IP, uh, whether that's uh, development tools, operating system ports, uh, as well as an actual roadmap for the IP itself uh, that can deliver a number of different um, um, PPA metrics associated with, with, with that implementation. Um, and then the last, and certainly not least, uh, going back to that deep patent portfolio is how, how are you protected by the IP that you're using that's open source? Um, and, and what about your IP portfolio? How much of that are you exposing if you participate in these communities and you know, decide to give, give back into the community? So there's, they're, not, they're, they're not unable to be overcome but nonetheless, the biz dev and, and legal departments of these commercial companies have a new consideration uh, when, when choosing to engage in an open hardware uh, development environment. So what about RISC-V? What's, why, why has there been a significant impact? As some of you may know, I, I was involved in getting the RISC-V Foundation started many years ago, and it's been a, a fantastic experience to see how RISC-V has uh, penetrated, you know, different markets around the world. Um, but what, what it's really enabled is unleashing a new frontier of processor design and innovation. You don't have to talk to anybody or, or get lawyers involved or anything from a licensing standpoint to decide that, hey, I want to start designing my own processor. Uh, so the, you know, the, the group on the panel here, we can get together, download the uh, RISC-V spec, 
and decide that we want to create a new processor design, you know, get, get that done over the weekend and throw it up on, a, on an open source uh, rip, uh, you know, repo or repository online and say, hey, here, here you go, we got, we got an open core. And that's interesting and wonderful from an innovation standpoint, but how many cores do we really need? Uh, how, how do we create uh, uh, industry momentum and establish critical mass around handfuls of cores that can be adopted in high volume production, thereby increasing the quality and, and, and comfort of all adopters to be able to use them. Much like today in the Linux environment, there's five or six distributions that matter. Uh, in the early days, you know, 15 to 20 years ago, there were many, many Linux distributions. Hopefully we don't take 20 years to figure this out, but part of the challenge is establishing this critical mass. So who are we and, and what's going on and what are we doing with the Eclipse Foundation? So the, the Eclipse Foundation has a very solid and well-proven uh, development process uh, to curate, uh, professionally manage open source artifacts and release those uh, into the industry. And within the open hardware group, we follow that development process and uh, are curating a, a whole range of open source RISC V cores called the Core 5 family. We have over 70 members and partners around the world, many, many of whom are in Europe. Uh, and very, very strong industry and academia, as well as individual contributors worldwide. So that's just to set a little context. Um, the, the, the work that we're doing uh, specifically uh, with Eclipse has a focus around industrial grade, robust, well-managed open source. And you know, being able to capitalize on this new innovation frontier that we talked about earlier, so that we can uh, have, have, have industry communities adopt open chip architectures to solve some of the technical problems that Paula talked about in her opening address. And we, you know, we, we very much look forward to more collaboration with industry, academia, uh, other organizations. Uh, you know, we're a member of the RISC V International Organization um, and are, are quite excited about the opportunity to establish a, a stronger footprint uh, in the European community. So with that, you know, here's some uh, links and, and so on that you could go to if you want to learn more about the Open Hardware Group and I'll be around for the Q&A after the uh, main speakers are, are done. Thank you, Paula. Thank you, Rick. Uh, I think the, the, there were some good questions in there. Uh, now, as we are, of course, a bit uh, uh, a bit uh, conscious of time. Uh, let's welcome Andrew on the stage. Super, am I live is the question. <laughs> yes, Andrew, you're alive. <laughs> um, hello, everyone. Thank you very much, um, Rick. Thank you very much indeed for that. Uh, as Rick uh, mentioned at the outset, um, uh, uh, there are sort of broad range of um, uh, different types of open hardware. So I'm just going to give you an introduction, uh, put that into context, talk a, a little bit more about broader range of open hardware um, and how that works. So um, let me press a few buttons and hopefully my presentation will appear shortly. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, so the best way to understand what open hardware is, and some people say open hardware, some people say open source hardware. I don't uh, get uh, particularly excited about this distinction between the two. I don't think a great deal turns on it. Uh, but the best place to start is to think about um, open source software. So uh, a brief definition of open source software is software which is available for anyone to use for any purpose. Um, you're, it's available for, for, for studying. Uh, you can modify it and you can redistribute it either as you got it or with modifications. Um, and that is the, 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 the characteristic, um, fundamental characteristic of open source software. Um, and uh, many of you will already be aware of this. It's absolutely everywhere. Um, open source software is, is um, eating the world. Just about every device that you look at uh, will 
contain open source software um, of one sort or another. Um, and um, it's even gone to Mars now. Um, and uh, it, it's in the helicopter. Um, Apparently uh, not on the rover, unfortunately, but um, there is a Linux based system um, on the helicopter. So open source software has gone to Mars. So why has open source software been so successful? Well, uh, the way that I look at it is uh, from a commercial perspective is that it is an ultra low friction means of collaborative research and development between organizations that potentially would not normally collaborate with each other, or if they were going to collaborate with each other, they would do so on the basis of you know, really complicated collaboration agreements that would go into great detail and great depth about what, who does what, what intellectual property is owned by whom, uh, who's allowed to apply for patents on what, and so on and so forth. So the beauty of being involved in an open source development um, project is that the formal documentation required is absolutely minimal. It can be as simple as just agreeing to use a particular license, although some projects do expand that a bit and they have contributor agreements and codes of conduct and so on. But in comparison to the sort of collaboration that you normally get in the commercial world, it is a vastly, vastly more straightforward. And that also means that there are fewer competition law concerns because it's open and uh, inclusive, um, it's much more difficult for somebody to argue that organization and organization, A and organization B uh, collaborating with each other on another product, on, uh, on a project in an anti-competitive way, if it's perfectly possible for their competitors, organization C and organization D to equally get involved as well. The problem doesn't go away, but it certainly simplifies it significantly. Uh, and from a developer's perspective, they like working in open source. Most developers are now uh, very used to working in open source software. Most of the tools that they use, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, um, are tools that are themselves open source software. Um, they are used to working uh, in a collaborative um, mechanism uh, with people distributed all over the world. Um, all of the tools that are available, the designs are very much in terms of, of, of collaboration. Um, and um, it's just, a, it's just a, a, a working environment, working mechanism that, uh, that developers are, are, are very happy to work in. And, and one of the other reasons for that is uh, they know that uh, they're not going to be asked to reinvent the wheel because they know that if they want, if, some, if they're asked to, for example, you know, produce um, a library module that says, um, you know, give me uh, the, the, uh, the day of a, um, a, of a particular date, what day of the week it is on a particular date, you know, they're not going to have to write that piece of code from scratch. They know that they, they can go out onto the internet and they can find some open source code that will do that and they can incorporate that code into what they want to do. So what they are doing, um, they feel is going to be much more productive because they're not going to be asked to do something that they know somebody has sweated over before. You know, who, who wants to do that? And the way that it, it works best in a commercial environment is for non-differentiating characteristics. And so what do I mean by that? Um, I mean that you know, if you're um, an organization who is producing a particular um, product, some of the characteristics of that product are differentiating, um, which means that's why people buy you. Um, so you know, people might buy a BMW uh, because of the engine that it has, for example, uh, but they're not particularly interested in buying it because of the operating system that runs within the uh, the engine control unit nobody's particularly particularly interested in that so that means that uh, there is less incentive for BMW to um, work cooperatively on engine development if they feel that by doing so they're essentially helping their competitors uh, but they're not going to be um, helping their competitors um, if they are working on the software that goes inside the engine control unit um, so there's much more it's much it makes much more sense for them to collaborate with their competitors on that basis because you know it's going to reduce their 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 own costs significantly uh, but it means that they're not giving their competitors um, a, 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 an undue advantage. And, you know, they can do the maths on that and decide when it works. So that's typically where open source works best is where it's w working on things that um, are not differentiating for the, for the product that you've got. So that was open source software. What do we mean by open hardware? Well, a very similar definition. Open source hardware is hardware the design for which is available for anyone to make, use for any purpose, to study, modify, and redistribute. So 
almost exactly the same as the case with, with open source software. And what sorts of hardware are we talking about? Uh, well, Rick mentioned a few at the beginning. Um, my own involvement with open hardware many years ago was for an open source car, uh, but you know you can have open source boats, houses. We're mainly talking about electronics and silicon chips here, uh, but also 3D printed objects, and they don't even have to be solid. You know, liquids like um, beer and cola have been reduced, uh, produced under open source licenses, um, but also um, you know things like hydraulic hydraulic fluids and, and that sort of thing uh, can can also be be described as open hardware. Um, and even viruses uh, can be described as open hardware as well. So, uh, but today we're mainly going to be talking about electronics and particularly um, silicon chips, so open silicon. So let's talk about um, open source software development and compare and contrast that uh, with um, open hardware development. So one of the well there's a number of reasons for the great success of open source software and one of them is that the barrier to entry is very very low the the the, the minimal amount of friction is absolutely critical to the success of open source software and you can be effective you know even if you've got very inexpensive equipment you just need to have a fairly basic pc you need to have an internet connection and even uh, most of the tools and the software that you need are all going to be themselves open source operating system. Um, Linux, uh, for example, the compiler that you use can be GCC, the new compiler collection. Uh, there are IDEs like Eclipse. Um, so an IDE is basically a sort of programmer's workbench that contains, uh, enables you to actually uh, write the program and, um, and and compile it from in, in sort of one location and so on. Um, so all of these things are themselves um, available as open source. So, you know, for, for the expenditure of a few hundred dollars um, and access to an internet connection, you can get yourself a perfectly functional workstation that will enable you to get fully involved in the world of open source software development. And the thing is that the final product is itself a digital artifact. So everything that, that we're doing happens in the digital domain, it happens in software, it happens inside your computer, um, it happens by tapping away on the keyboard, looking at the screen and, and, and so on. And uh, that's that's pretty significant for reasons we'll, we'll have a look um, at in a moment, but it fundamentally uh, is based on this idea of a design, build, test cycle. And again, I'll talk about that um, uh, shortly. But one of the key things is that uh, Rick touched on is that it makes it very, very easy to collaborate with um, anyone anywhere in the world. Um, you know, this, this is development without without borders. If you're working in um, in the digital domain, there's no reason why you can't uh, be collaborating with somebody um, who is on the other side of the planet from you. And uh, in in fact, one of the uh, problems that uh, that we had um, do, doing the uh, the impact study for the European Commission um, is that uh, trying to identify where a particular project is based because you know sometimes you really can't put a finger on that that there are contributors from all over the world um, and um, so that means that uh, you know even uh, that makes it extremely straightforward to 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 create these communities uh, it's not always quite as straightforward as it sounds. Um, open source by definition is free to use, uh, but that doesn't mean that uh, there aren't licenses that need to be complied with and the licensing can be somewhat complicated, but I'm not gonna go into to details about that at the moment. So um, just looking a little bit more at this design build test cycle. So if you, you look at the diagram on, on the left, um, you'll see that basically you, know, you design something in terms of software that, that basically means thinking about what you want it to do um, and then um, uh, write it um, in the computer language, um, like Python, Java, C++, whatever it happens to be. Um, then you'll build it, uh, which basically means compiling it. Um, then you've got an executable, which you can test. And then as a result of that testing, uh, then um, you know you presumably detect a few problems with it. So you go back to the design phase, correct the errors, build it, test it again. You've got a cycle. And because that's all happening inside your computer, that can happen very, very quickly. And it also means that it be, can be going on sort of simultaneously in different people's Computers, different people can be working on the same project, change different bits of it, um, and using uh, technologies such as Git and sites like GitHub and GitLab, it's very easy for people to collaborate and um, identify where where bugs are and change them, or suggest that they that they that those changes are made, and so on. And then eventually, you reach a point where you want to release 
this product to the public, and then you go to the productize phase here. Um, and that means that the product is available to the customer. And in the case of software, uh, productization, you know, it might not even happen in a formal step at all. Uh, there's quite a lot of projects uh, that will exist on, on GitHub where uh, you can just, somebody just says, right, I think we're ready to release now. But no, there's no fundamental difference. Um, it just means that people can go onto, the, onto GitHub, download, the, download your, your project um, and use it. Um, and then, of course, you'll also get some feedback uh, from the, the customers. And that's where the yellow dotted line comes in. It goes back into the test cycle again. So this can be very rapid. It can be very distributed. Um, and it can run very efficiently. Um, in the world of hardware, um, you can have the same, same thing, design, build, test. Uh, but especially if you're talking about physical hardware, like cars, for example, um, it's much more difficult for this, this to happen in the, 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 uh, in the digital domain. Some of it can. Um, and um, you know there is software that will help you to um, um, you know analyze uh, things like aerodynamics um, and uh, the effect of suspension component tuning and that sort of thing. But the reality is to get very far, uh, you are going to have to physically make this thing. So that's why we've got um, in the in, in the right hand diagram this this um, uh, simulate bit that says that um, you know in the world of of, um, of really hard hardware uh, you can do a degree of simulation, but basically you've actually got to physically build something to test it. And obviously that slows down these cycles um, uh, continuously. So you're still going to need um, a PC and an internet connection, uh, but you're going to need a lot more than that. And for something like a car, you're going to need a workshop. You know, you may need 3D printers. Um, you may need things like access to significant industrial amounts of power, three-phase supplies. Uh, you ne may need large industrial equipment like milling machines and lathes. Um, you know, if you're um, making um, open hardware viruses, you might need something like a PCR machine. Uh, if you're making beer, you're going to need a, a mash tun. And you're going to need feed stock for all of this. So for cars, you'll need steel. For 3D printers, you need plastic filament. Um, if you're making electronics, you're going to need electronic components. And if you're making beer, you're going to need oats, barley, yeast, and water. Um, and all of those you know, are, are additional um, constraints on, on what you're doing. Now, some of the digital tools, like the operating system and editors and, and some CAD tools, um, are available as open source. Uh, but many of them aren't. So there's going to be um, a cost involved, even if you're in purely in the digital domain, there's likely to be a cost involved. Um, and that, of course, you know, it means that there's a, a greater barrier to entry as well. And um, that means that the design build test cycle, it, it may be digital in parts with hardware, um, but it will mean that certainly for the harder sorts of hardware, the manufacturing, whether it's local or remote, is going to be slower. Um, than it is with software. And it's going to be much more difficult to collaborate at a distance if you're dealing with hard hardware like suspension components um, than it, it is if you're dealing with software. Um, and it's also the case that um, you know, licensing is also complicated within the, the world of open hardware development as well, um, and, and for different reasons. The impact of intellectual property rights, um, and there are many more things like uh, various sorts of design rights, semiconductor mask rights, um, in addition to the usual things like copyright right and patent, the extent to which that impinges is more complicated as well. And also, it tend, those things, other than copyright um, and to a degree patents, the other forms of intellectual property right do tend to differ from country to country, which adds a, a sort of another, another layer of complexity as well. Um, open electronics um, sits in the middle somewhere. So here we're talking about designs for printed circuit boards and circuit diagrams and, and, and so on. And there is some open source software um, available. KiCad is an excellent um, example of that. Um, but other sorts of software for simulation and so on is proprietary, tends to be fairly expensive. Um, and one of the things about if you're making printed circuit boards, um, if they're fairly simple, you can make them at home. You don't need particularly specialized equipment. But there are services available now where where you can send your files over to a company, they can make them very inexpensively and send them back to you within a day or two. So that in itself is fairly rapid cycling. It's much quicker than you know if you're trying to make a, 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 an open hardware car, for example. And it's also something that is, can be fairly well distributed. Somebody can take your design for printed circuit board. Um, you know, if they're in, in, in Hong Kong, it's very incredibly <laughs> easy for them to find somebody who can manufacture that PCB for them. Uh, but even throughout Europe, 
Europe um, and uh, throughout the Americas and so on, the, there are uh, plenty of organizations that will be able to make those PCBs to your design very quickly and very inexpensively. So in that case, the design build test cycle can be fairly rapid, it can be fairly well distributed. Um, and that means that open electronics are quite amenable to this open source um, development methodology. Now, when we're talking about open silicon, uh, what we're talking here is about um, designs for silicon chips. Um, so uh, typically uh, processors and, and, uh, and, and so on. Um, and they're designed using hardware description languages that are languages that look very similar to computer programming languages, um, but, uh, but they, they, they have a different specific purpose. What they do is um, you, you write your logic in one of these hardware description languages, and then you you um, use a synthesis tool which compiles it um, into a form that can be processed um, into more primitive code that can get actually turned into the, the, the uh, chip for itself. Um, I've got to say, I'm running a little bit um, slow here. Is it okay if I take another five minutes or so? Or do you want me to speed up? Uh, hi, Andrew. Maybe like four minutes, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> So um, an awful lot of this can happen um, inside a computer um, in much the same way as it can with software. From, to that extent, the development of open silicon and uh, an open source software um, is, is, is very, very similar. The main difference being that whereas if you're developing software, the tool chain is going to be mainly open source. Uh, with open silicon, uh, that is unlikely to be the case. Um, the, there are a number of, as I said, open source products. Um, but uh, that, uh, that that number is increasing. But the but, but most of the, the the products are still proprietary, um, and there are plenty of open silicon um, designs um, out there um, based on uh, Risk Five, um, as Rick said, and there are other ISAs as well as, as well that are uh, out there as well. Uh, but the thing about using proprietary uh, software is that it includes some um, proprietary um, IP blocks, and that um, is a, a, a challenge. So I'm very going to briefly explain what these magic devices FPGAs are. Um, this little device there. So they're basically chips that can be configured to do pretty much anything. So if you think of them as, a, as an array of blank array of cells, uh, you can configure each of those cells to become um, a logic gate, a transistor, whatever. And you can uh, means that you can configure an FPGA to be a processor, uh, an interface, um, a system on a chip, um, virtually any sort of collection of logic gates that you can think of can be programmed into, into an FPGA. And uh, the only constraints really are how many blank cells you've got, um, how fast you want it to be, and how much money you've got. Um, and they can also be uh, reconfigured multiple times um, as, as well. So uh, you can immediately see that um, as when, when we're talking about um, the, the development cycle, um, you know, these, these things are sort of fantastic asset. Uh, but not only that, you know, they can be inexpensive. Basic ones start at a dollar or so. So actually, um, you you can uh, design some uh, a chip design, load it into an FPGA, and use that for production as well. Um, so the design, build, and test cycle is almost identical uh, to that um, used for software. So. Where does that leave us from policymakers perspective? And I think these are these are the sort of the, I think the main um, policy issues that I identified. I don't claim to have the answers to them, but these are things that we need to think about. So basically, open technologies are all about reducing friction and dis facilitating this distributed and collaborative research and development. Um, open source software um, has been around for much longer. So as a result, it, it can provide us with a lot of information to guide us. But there are significant differences and we always need to be aware of, of, of those. Uh, there is still friction in terms of intellectual property and licensing. Um, and we need access to more low cost and interoperable service, uh, software um, in the world of, of open hardware as well. Um, I mentioned the problems that we have with proprietary um, IP blocks. They tend to increase um, friction because they're proprietary and they're not as interoperable as they should be. Um, and at the moment, we have market dominance um, in, in the world of open silicon by big three players, um, all of whom are based in the US. Uh, there's an extent to which this market is still dominated by proprietary thinking, um, and that needs to be, be addressed. Um, and all of these tend to reduce opportunities for involvement for individuals and 
SMEs. And I think the, the future um, of open silicon is very down to um, much down to the, the involvement um, of individuals and SMEs um, in much the same way as that has driven open source software as well. Uh, so um, apologies uh, for um, overrunning. Um, thank you very much for listening. That's what I have to say. Thank you, Andrew. I, I found it very informative. Uh, and I think now as we are running out of time, <laughs> uh, let's go straight to, to the next presentation from uh, Javier Sedano. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, Can you see my slides? Mm -hmm. Yes. OK, great. Thank you. So it's a great pleasure to be here to tell you a bit about um, uh, open source hardware developments going on at CERN. I'm going to take the angle of a public institution. And I'm also going to speak about hardware, which is not, not chip design. This is more bigger hardware, printed circuit boards, enclosures, and computer networks. So uh, the. Uh, aim of my talk is to describe public core, which is this paradigm that emerged kind of naturally in our White Rabbit project, and hopefully can serve as a template uh, for policymakers when they try to decide the role of public institutions in, in public and private uh, partnerships. Uh, so I will start with a very quick intro to CERN and the, to the White Rabbit project for context, and then I will continue uh, with some words on our open sourcing experience, things that we believe we did right, and things that we think we can improve in the future, uh, then move on to this public core concept and finish with some uh, plans for the near future. So CERN, as uh, you probably know, uh, this is taking some time to come. I don't know if you can see anything on your screen. Uh, OK, so CERN is a uh, the biggest uh, particle physics laboratory in the world. It's made of a big network of accelerators. And uh, the ultimate product is the particle beam that physicists use to uh, examine the fundamental constitu constituents of matter by uh, having in this uh, bigger circle here, which is the LHC, the biggest particle accelerator in the world, by having collisions and analyzing what comes out of those collisions. Now, there is a lesser known uh, part of our mandate, uh, which is sharing what we do. And uh, it comes from our founding document, uh, which is the CERN Convention. It was drafted in the 50s, and it uh, says, among other things, that uh, the things we do should be published or otherwise made generally available. Now, uh, for those of us uh, working at CERN today, uh, a legitimate question is to see how that mandate should be interpreted in the technological scene of the 21st century. So open science is a big thing at CERN, of course, and it encompasses a number of opens, like open source software, open hardware, open data, and open access. And uh, at CERN, we're very proud that all these opens rely on a fundamental building block of a piece of infrastructure, uh, which is the World Wide Web, which was invented at CERN. So uh, a few words about White Rabbit. Uh, in, a, in a distributed accelerator, in a big accelerator like the LHC, uh, we need different pieces of the accelerator to be synchronized with one another. And um, uh, a few years ago, we invented and developed a technology called White Rabbit, which is an extension of Ethernet. So in a White Rabbit network, uh, you have basically switches and nodes. So they are interconnected. And by virtue of the White Rabbit protocol, uh, you, you get a common notion of time everywhere. So uh, White Rabbit offers two extensions with respect to standard Ethernet. One is the sub-nanosecond synchronization, so a synchronization better than one billionth of a second. And the other one is guaranteed latency. So uh, the uh, time it takes for a message to go from any point of the network to any other point it has an upper bound. And this is very convenient, very useful for controls and data acquisition. White Rabbit is fully open source hardware, gateware, software. And it is also standardized under IEEE 1588, uh, which is also called the Precision Time Protocol. And this has also helped, along with the fact that it's open source, in the adoption in many domains, as, as I will show later. Let me see. <laughs> the slides are uh, coming a bit slowly. I hope that that's not too penalizing. Uh, so. Uh, 
just uh, a quick look at the fundamental building blocks of a white rabbit network. This is the white rabbit switch. Uh, it is an Ethernet switch. Inside, uh, you have uh, an embedded Linux system and uh, an FPGA with uh, uh, the, the fast part of the uh, routing of the of the packets of the frames. And uh, it is fully open source, mechanics, printed circuit board, gateway software, and commercially available by at least uh, four companies that I'm aware of. Then in uh, White Rabbit Networks, you also have the nodes and we have a reference design so people can start uh, quickly uh, in the form of a PCI Express board, uh, which has uh, support for White Rabbit, And it also, you can customize its function uh, by plugging in different types of mezzanines. So it can become, for example, an analog to digital converter uh, by plugging in an ADC uh, mezzanine. Okay, so uh, a bit of a look at our open sourcing experience. Uh, things we did right, first of all, uh, uh, we we made things modular and we adopted this layered approach whereby the, the problem we needed to solve at CERN is the synchronization of accelerators, but we built this generic foundation, which is White Rabbit, and then applications can be built on top of it. And we knew from the beginning that um, our friends in other scientific facilities would find that useful, people in people we know in neutrino telescopes, in cosmic ray detectors, for example, that was a very natural fit. And already there for, for society, there were quite a lot of savings by the sharing and not needing to develop uh, this basic infrastructure again and again. The next uh, natural adopters were metrology offices. So the people who uh, make and distribute official time in each one of your countries, very naturally adopted White Rabbit. And then through the magic of open source and standardization, uh, White Rabbit found applications in many areas. And this is a little known fact, but many, many domains need very fine synchronization, including electric power distribution, mobile telephony, and, and even finance. You have to timestamp all the packets very precisely to analyze what happened when. We also, uh, uh, did things right regarding companies. So we involved them from uh, the very beginning. And uh, this is a bit of a, a difference with respect to free and open source software in the sense that you can do open source software without companies. If you really want to, you can you know, download code from GitHub, compile it, modify, publish again. In, in open source hardware, uh, not involving companies is not an, op not an option. Uh, for, the, for, for all but the most trivial designs, you need at least a company that will make things, test and, and distribute for you. Uh, so from the very beginning, we discussed with companies and they are an essential ingredient of our open source hardware practice. It's also a very nice and easy way to get extra talent in a project. Uh, and because everything is open source, there is no risk of vendor lock-in. Now, things that we can do a bit better. We anticipated that if White Rabbit were successful, um, there would be a, a lot of support requests. And we thought we had a good plan for that. We thought that the uh, uh, companies would provide support and people would pay for that support. In the end, what happened is that companies offered support contracts, but nobody bought them. And uh, people just bought the hardware and asked questions in the forum, which means that the White Rabbit experts, they felt compelled to answer, but it's really outside their day job. So it's it's a strain on them. That's a problem for, for sustainability of the project. And uh, also uh, the same thing applies to uh, coordination, to managerial effort. So we could do a bit with a bit more effort on the steering side of things. And the lack of time devoted to these managerial activities results sometimes in, in missed opportunities, in confusion, and generally uh, it's uh, less, uh, uh, less likely that people will come in and adopt uh, White Rabbit. Despite this, and with these caveats, uh, we, we think White Rabbit has been a technological success and also a success from the point of view of uh, knowledge and technology transfer. Um, there are many ways to uh, synchronize things to within one nanosecond. And, and White Rabbit has become a de facto standard. And I believe that, uh, that the key feature of the, or the key reason is its openness. It's the only option to do this kind of thing, which is fully open source. Uh, also, very early on, we decided that we would not choose between open and commercial that we would have both and that this is the winning combination actually between because open gives you this this lack of risk for vendor lock-in and and commercial gives you the scalability the fact that you will have commercial support and you don't have to do everything yourself on the kind of public institution side of things okay so um i'm reaching the 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 core of the talk which is this kind of 
way uh, that White Rabbit kind of self-organized. Uh, I gave a name to it, Public Core, uh, because I think there are some aspects of it which are new, uh, and it's always uh, uh, easier to refer to these things with a with a name. So uh, there is in White Rabbit and in many other projects. Um, a public core, which is made of these, in the case of White Rabbit, is the switch. It's the reference implementation of the nodes, things that people can build upon. And uh, the, the way things have been arranged uh, naturally in White Rabbit is that public institutions have been contributing to this public core mostly. And in the periphery of the project, uh, there is proprietary innovation. And the companies which do that can afford to have higher margins uh, in the periphery because these blocks are not open source and they can more easily monetize them. This is the way things have evolved. Uh, uh, I know in other projects the share between public core and you know the, the size of these blocks is not exactly the same the relative sizes uh, but the, the the reasoning still applies. Uh, for those of you coming from the software world, you might be uh, familiar with the open core business model, uh, whereby for example a company has this uh, community edition of their software which is fully open source and free as in free beer, and then they have these proprietary plugins that you can buy, and and they are not open source. Um, in that case, sometimes there is a bit of a conflict of interest because the same company is in charge of the core uh, and the proprietary extensions. They might have an interest to push users to buy the extensions and then in the course of doing so, uh, maybe making the core barely usable. Uh, uh, one thing we have uh, in, our, in our project is that there is no conflict of interest because there's really uh, clear distinction in the communities driving uh, the public core and uh, the proprietary extensions. And in particular, uh, the public institutions are only concerned with the core. And private companies are in the periphery, but also in the core when it's appropriate, when it's in their interest. And this can happen with public money because a public institution pays them to work on something or, uh, or with their own funds if they think that's um, in their interest. Another way of looking at this is that uh, we have this public core, which is really a commons, and then um, different actors uh, build applications on top of these commons. When you contribute to the public core, you're uh, ra lifting the ground for everybody. So everybody builds on higher ground and the value gets bigger for all these applications. So it's really in their interest uh, to, to make sure that the public core is in a healthy state. Now, there is also a very important time dimension. So uh, sometimes uh, the community driving the public core might find it uh, important for it to evolve in a given direction where there is proprietary development going on and uh, get that into the public core. And then the company or companies which were there innovating, they go someplace else in order to keep the high margins and they keep innovating uh, in a proprietary way. Uh, there is one case in which this cannot happen, and this can be an issue. Uh, it's when these proprietary innovations are patented, and then, uh, of course, the public core uh, cannot go in that direction. So this is an issue, and I will say a few words in the next slide about how this, this can be dealt with. So uh, I just presented the this paradigm of public core. I had introduced some issues with White Rabbit before then. Uh, how can uh, these ideas uh, help with the issues we identified in White Rabbit? And, and how applicable is this for other projects? Uh, so the first thing we decided, a bit inspired by um, many successful examples around us, including those who are, which are, have been presented and are going to be presented today, is to add a collaboration agreement uh, in addition to this public core padding, formalize things a bit. And this collaboration will have as one of its, uh, one of its uh, objectives to bring in revenue, uh, which can be used for a number of things, uh, what, sorry, which, which can be derived from a number of things, none of which has an impact on the open source nature of the public core. So things like certification, training, consultancy, and so on. And that will be used to pay labor for, uh, for, for dealing with the shortage of uh, support uh, uh, and uh, resources and the, uh, and the managerial side of things. There is also an open rule that can be uh, uh, part of this agreement so that people uh, agree that it, these extensions in the periphery of the project will not be patented so the core can grow in that direction if needed. 
And uh, why, why do I think a public call will work? Well, first of all, because it's not that new. It's, um, you know, this, the experience elsewhere in many projects, for example, the Linux kernel is a big example, but also the, uh, the uh, collaborations we are, we are uh, going to discuss today. Um, the only, the only refine, so people, people are already used to collaborating and pooling resources for creating common infrastructure and build on that, uh, to monetize, uh, uh, extensions. Uh, this is a very common theme. The only refinement is a clear mapping between public institutions and the open source core. So you don't ask from public institutions sub something which is a bit unnatural, in my opinion, which is to keep things secret, to not publish things. Uh, and conversely, you don't expect, uh, commercial companies to publish everything they do on a, under an open source license. Uh, and the, the other reason I think it will work is because as I said, White Rabbit very organically and naturally evolved this way. So all the actors are already at places which they find, they find natural. So what next? Uh, we're going to explore uh, this combination of public core and a collaboration agreement, as I said, to bring in revenue, we have a draft for a collaboration agreement, which is has been sent to the White Rabbit community, and it's going to be discussed in a meeting on the 25th of this month. Uh, and the um, the goal is really to ensure the health of the open source core, but also very importantly, provide for a thriving economy in the periphery. And and we really hope this can become a template uh, and uh, a source of inspiration for policymakers, uh, in particular to prove that commercial interests and open source hardware can not only coexist, but actually reinforce each other. And also something very important from our perspective as a public institution, uh, in the past, many people have explored you know, the way public institutions can be economic engines, but mostly uh, through patenting and royalties. And uh, we really think uh, that there is a case to be made for being as active economically, as much of an important actor economically or more, uh, without sacrificing this basic mission of contributing to the commons. So that's what I wanted to tell you, and I will be very happy to participate in the Q&A session now. Okay, thank you, Javier. Uh, let's maybe bring uh, Rick and Andrew uh, on screen as well. I didn't see uh, any questions uh, in the chat right now, uh, but of course uh, I have some question my questions myself, and I guess also our other speakers uh, might have some questions. Um, but the first one that comes to my mind is, you know, that you, you showed us the, the outlook and Andrew showed us the challenges and sort of the questions. Um, Okay, uh, we have a question from Zvonimir, so maybe you know I will I will give the the priority to Zvonimir. Uh, does White Rabbit support P four programming? I assume that's uh, the question too. <laughs> yes, uh, I must say I don't know what P four programming is, so maybe uh, Zvonimir can can say a few words about it, but probably that means no. <laughs> P four P four programming is a is a programming uh, language for for programmable Ethernet switches. Okay, so I see. It's it's it, and there there are definitely open source and partially open source software stacks for P4, which indeed started uh, on large FPGA chips from Altera and Xilinx before people started making custom silicon for P4 programmability. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, no, I, I, yeah. we don't have that in the base um, right. distribution it's, of White maybe, Rabbit. And I believe it's probably something that can actually be developed in software. I don't think you need a design change yet. Yeah, we have a running embedded Linux yeah. inside the switch and anything you can run in there, um, you can add. And we have done the things in the past, uh, like adding SNMP support and other yeah. ways of talking to the switch that were done in that way by developing software that runs in the embedded. Uh, Linux. The, yeah. This would be hard, kind of you know a hardware layer. I think mm -hmm. it, it's it's not in software because of very low latency. All right, you can check out just by finding P four. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Svanimir. I think that uh, this shows quite well the, the blurry line between software and hardware and how they interconnect. And uh, this is actually where my question was going a bit, uh, because I mean, Andrew, you talked about the challenges and, and you have your talked, you know, about the, the outlook and, and sort of the plans, you know, how to make it a bit more sustainable. Um, but my question is, uh, is it very diverse in the open hardware landscape? Because we know that for open source software, we can find some business models, we can, you know, like, 
take quite an easy example from other projects, other initiatives or business models. And is it also the case for hardware that we can, you know, even though it might be on a bit slightly different layer in terms of the softwareness, hardwareness, can we still take the same example and, you know, just follow the model in a way? Um, it is very diverse, um, and there are, are a number of different models. And, and what, what has been interesting that there are um, projects um, like um, uh, LimeWire, RF, for example, um, where you potentially have um, you've got a, you've got a, a software community which is. Um, uh, coalescing around the firmware and the software that you use to communicate with the project um, and then it's got an FPGA inside it and then you've got another community that's coalescing around um, writing the HDL um, to configure the the FPGA and then you've got yet another community um, who are working on the PCBs around that uh, and those communities they, they, they work in in different ways and I think quite a lot of this has to do with the with with the speed of the the, the cycle um, and also the um, you know ability for people to be able to collaborate at, at a distance and basically the harder the hardware uh, so the more you know if you the, the more that you're talking about the sort of physical part of the object is more important um, the more difficult it is for, for um, people to collaborate unless they're they're actually in sort of physically um, reasonably close to each other mm -hmm. okay thank you i don't know if you have any thoughts on this javier yes i, I agree the more hardware like the project is um the result the result the, the more added value to get a bit organized as well in software it's very easy to have an informal organization that evolves very quickly and that does the interesting things very quickly in a lightweight in a lightweight way um, and uh, in hardware it is important in my opinion um you know the the more friction there is for this cycle of you know iteration producing and so on uh the more important it becomes to have a bit of organization and the, hence the uh, the success of these initiatives i think that we're seeing uh in the form of consortia foundations and, and so on mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay uh thank you we have uh, one more question and then we will uh move to svanimir's presentation uh, i'm going just to read it uh, for large companies that are completely invested in the patent philosophy since decades what do you think could convince them to part with patents when collaborating with the public core uh, I, is that a question for me? Yes, I, I, guess. I, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, the, I think there has to be an, a, an economic case. I trust companies, and this is something I never do. I never substitute myself for companies and tell them what to think. Uh, I think they are very capable, much more than me, to figure out if something is economically interesting for them or not. Uh, and uh, if we set things up in a compelling way, including with their help, they can also tell us uh, what is interesting for them, what are uh, you know things that they would accept or they, that would make it difficult for them to collaborate uh, with us. Uh, so in including that help from them, I think um, we can find ways in which it can be a compelling case for them. And the, the, the proof is that these, these collaborations are already working very nicely with companies in them. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Javier. Uh, I can add for myself that in our study on the impact of open source software, we found the numbers that prove, you know, the economical viability of opening, uh, you know, sort of within companies who have very diverse business models, uh, but we weren't able to find it in uh, hardware yet. So this is this very big research gap that I think we we might have to I think, I, I, solve. I think Frank is saying in the chat that uh, we have people who could... Uh, yes, yes. And I think we'll... Uh, this, it's, it's a great... Mm -hmm. I think it's a great uh, it's a great switch to the next presentation because Vanimi will you know discuss basically this. Mm -hmm. uh, so for now, uh, thank you Javier, thank you thank you Andrew. I know that Andrew will join us in the second Q and A, um, and Javier has some uh, other speaking engagements uh, yes. happening now. Uh, so thank you again, uh, and now uh, I will welcome Zvonimir on screen. Thank you. Thank Bye. you, thank you, Paul. Should I now uh, share the video? Yes, please. All right, and then if you want, you can also share your video. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and now share the screen. Also, feel free uh, by addressing the the question that uh, we discussed as as the last one, because I think there is some interest in hearing your opinion on that. Is this the uh, Lalit mm -hmm. Patnaik question? Mm -hmm. Yes. You mean on the patent yes. philosophy? 
Mm -hmm. All right, great. Okay, we see your full screen for now. All right. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right, so I'll introduce uh, Chips Alliance and kind of I'll try to zero in on some of these, you know, um, uh, questions on, on what exactly is a business reason to work on an open source hardware uh, projects. Uh, um, very briefly, uh, I'll introduce what Chips Alliance is. Uh, I'll follow that with the Blue Hat business model. And then if I have time, I'll... Touch after having spent two years are a foundational block for for sort of uh, enablement of open source hardware projects and bringing them on a big um, uh, bring them on a level that's sort of similar to where the uh, Linux uh, operating system uh, is today. Um, so Chips Alliance, who are we? Uh, it's an organization which develops and hosts open source hardware code, think like IP cores, like a open source CPUs. Uh, open source software design tools is our fastest growing component and something, something that uh, uh, definitely brings a lot of uh, um, uh, commercially funded uh, projects into, into Chips Alliance. And then interconnect IP, uh, physical and logical protocols, which attracts uh, a, a lot of a lot of interest, and uh, especially from academia. It's a barrier-free environment for collaboration. Uh, it's a standards organization framework when it comes to collaboration and development, and we have a legal committee as a part of the organization that uh, helps set this up. And uh, we also have a, a, a legal framework that's built around the Apache V2 license. And the general idea uh, is why would anybody want to do this is basically sharing resources, dollars and, and engineering time to lower the cost of the hardware development for both IP and tools. It doesn't necessarily cover everything, you know, that exists in, in the worlds of ASIC and hardware, but it does cover uh, those areas where company have uh, common interests, like, like RISC-5 course that, uh, that uh, Rick O'Connor has uh, mentioned for the Open Hardware Design uh, Group. Um, who, who, is, uh, uh, who are the members of Chips Alliance? Uh, this chart keeps, keeps changing on me, and probably I, I have some logo incorrect uh, <laughs> or, or some organization missing. Uh, a large number of companies and universities and continuously growing. Uh, in terms of organization, we are organized uh, um, uh, similarly to the RISC V. We are part of the Linux Foundation, uh, and uh, we are uh, controlled by the uh, board of directors. And uh, uh, we are managed by general manager Rob Mains. Uh, Rob uh, um, is um, is, uh, uh, is is a uh, full-time dedicated to to running running chips alliance and uh, brought significant experience from the eda tools industry we have henry cook that uh, that chairs technical committee uh, on which we onboarded a number of projects uh, and uh, uh, there is also some professional staff from linux foundation helping with legal finance and brian warner which is the, who is operations community manager and a program program manager for for various uh, projects and programs in, in in chips and finally we have michael gilda who leads the outreach and marketing committee and work, is working on advocacy outreach processes etc uh, there's a number of different work groups uh, in the organizations uh, in the organization interconnect rocket soc cores tools ai accelerator chisel work group and and several more so this chart is getting uh, uh, I, I actually more and more difficult to, to manage. For, for detail list, I, I suggest uh, check uh, GitHub uh, for Chips Alliance. Um, major milestones that we achieved in 2020. Uh, we started a major project on system Verilog expansion of Verilator. Uh, this is uh, one of our uh, biggest projects. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try to mention it a little bit later. This is, this is a simulation tool that's built in open source. It's a major building block for enabling open source design verification. And, and it's a very effective collaboration tool. 
We started uh, several new projects uh, uh, that joined in 2020. These are Chisel, which is the largest uh, open source hardware compiler project, and, and Open Road, which is which is trying to actually build a complete tool chain from the design to the mask set into the open source. We released the AIB 2.0 chiplet specification. Uh, it's a chiplet in, uh, physical uh, interface uh, uh, that's uh, championed and led by Intel and adopted in a large number of uh, uh, companies. We deliver a new generation of server RISC V cores that uh, came from Western Digital team. Uh, and this includes the first open source dual threaded high performance uh, core targeting embedded real time. And we successfully demonstrated Omni Extend uh, memory centric compute system, which is a cache coherence over Ethernet architecture. Uh, so now, Jumping on, you know, uh, some of the motivation, why do people do this? Um, I sort of tentatively named this blue hat business model. I don't have a trademark, uh, but the idea is to make it uh, uh, to make it uh, the analog of the red hat uh, business model that was championed by the red hat company in Linux. Um, the um, the taxonomy that I want to use, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll glean over this quickly. I think Andrew has explained already. Uh, open source software uh, uh, covers open source operating systems and applications where source code is available under one of the recognized open source software licenses like GPL, LGPL, Apache. Um, the the uh, interesting points are some require open source contributions to flow back to the community like in GPL and some are more per permissive like Apache which are dominant, currently dominant in open source hardware. Open source hardware uh, can be open source hardware designs uh, and they're typically done in Verilog or system Verilog and they imp implement specific IPs uh, like RISC-5 core or DDR controller. Um, and uh, sometimes uh, can be just the source code in, in, in Verilog but sometimes, especially when you include files, like what we do for AIB 2.0 chiplet, uh, it can uh, include uh, uh, actual circuit designs. It can even include a whole GDS2 mask. Open source hardware design EDA tools, on the other hand, uh, are open source software tools needed for hardware design. And uh, as such, they are the building blocks and enabling block for everything that follows. And uh, as we learned, this is uh, this is really an uh, important component of the com uh, complete uh, flow of uh, open source hardware IP. And it's currently getting a lot of attention in Chips Alliance. So uh, what can be Blue Hat IP? So I, oh, anything that you produce that works can actually become a cornerstone uh, of Blue Hat IP. And uh, the, the business model theory roughly looks like this. Um, the, and it comes in phases, right? In, uh, the idea is to have a collaboration with partners, customers, and open source contributors to develop certain technology. And this can be done in phases. In the phase one, you sort of have a community, uh, driven project that comes via Linux foundation lifecycle. And Linux foundation lifecycle is something that really, uh, really allows uh, anybody to start to start any project uh, without any limitations, without any sort of uh, difficult boundary conditions and constraints. And in a phase two, we have an attractor project where a lot of uh, typically smaller companies, startups, uh, academic groups get really interested, they get really attracted because it's something new like AI or, or a new type of RISC-5 core. And this becomes a development vehicle. New versions are popping out on an agile schedule. It could be unstable. It moves fast. Uh, it's it's super suitable for academic projects and you know masters and PhD thesis. Not necessarily ready for the commercial application due to its stability. The phase three uh, brings opportunity to monetize, uh, and the foundation of that idea. Uh, free IP uh, is open source, but it's not necessarily um, uh, like free beer. It's more like free speech. And open source IP from chips at that point becomes basis. It remains open source and remains available on GitHub under well-defined licenses like Apache V2. 
but uh, it's used to build additional 24 seven customer support. This comes uh, as an integration support, as a uh, bug support, as services, additional services that are built around the IP. And, uh, and uh, it's an opportunity to monetize the open source IP. So I think, I think this is what we've seen for the White Rabbit, exactly like that. You can have, uh, you can have a product built around this IP, you can have additional subcomponents uh, that, that are not necessarily in open source. And finally, you can have services, like in case of ISIC IP, the design verification uh, offers an opportunity for to build, to build a specific service. Um, and um, let's see, um, in the, the, to support commercialization then, uh, just kind of to summarize this, the phase three uh, is, is, uh, is really where, where the monetization comes. Uh, and um, uh, the, the service support is probably the, 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 the first thing. For example, Codasip uh, provides a design verification services around the Swerve IP. Uh, potential value at IP, uh, again, in case of Codasip, uh, they, they use their design tools to add additional features to the Swerve core. Uh, and then it supports the Swerve uh, customers uh, by providing uh, bug fixes, uh, guarantees for compliance, uh, uh, and sort of uh, se several other value add uh, services. The, the, uh, I added this section um, uh, uh, because I think it's interesting to sort of explain one, one more level of, of detail is what kind of things are important to develop in the open source. So uh, if, you, if you look uh, at, uh, at work groups, um, the significant amount of activity that we have in Chips Alliance is happening around tool work groups that have a very later Chisel, Fuse, SOC, and several other uh, uh, software development projects. And um, the, this is the moment where it's interesting to sort of remember the history. The, uh, the Linux operating system uh, had a, a very important component to, uh, that uh, it owes its success called GNU toolchain. And uh, GNU toolchain essentially um, uh, represents a set of tools, compilers, debuggers, etc., that were necessary in order to compile the Linux operating system source code and produce the binary that can run on various computers. It also became an essential building block for the open source licensing model championed by Linux, which is GPL, which uh, sort of required uh, required that the that the uh, generating outputs from the tool chain uh, had to be uh, open source, and and that um, and that defined you know how would that actually work. So then the the, the question is what would be the equivalent of the GNU tool chain when it comes to hardware. And it's a hardware simulation and compilation tools that are equivalent you know to the GNU tool chain in the open source hardware. So this is something where we put some accent. If you look, uh, if you look at this chart here, it represents you know the typical flow in the in the ASIC from architecture specification, which can be a PowerPoint, Word, and Excel document, um, to the RTL design tools that uh, that uh, that generate uh, that generate that are typically in the form of Verilog and system Verilog files, and those can be run through the simulators. And those can be run through the verification uh, IP and uh, various verification test batches. After that come synthesis, timing, place and route, etc. So, so this top part is something that uh, where we put uh, accent in our first two years, and and there there are some uh, significant uh, and interesting successes. Probably uh, number one, our projects uh, around uh, expansion of the Verilator. So Verilator is a pre-existing open source design tool that, uh, that uh, has a significant performance advantage compared to the commercial tools in both the compilation time and execution time for hardware simulation. And uh, we have worked um, uh, uh, inside the Chips Alliance on, on adding system Verilog extensions into the Verilator, 
which uh, enables Verilator to become a major tool for the RTL verification part, for the design verification. And, and that project uh, that is going really well has, um, has, really, has really set up a, a, a new playground where companies working on open source projects can completely collaborate by using open source design tools. Um, which significantly significantly simplifies how the collaboration is done, and also enables potentially new uh, uh, new and improved uh, licensing models. And then the second project of that kind is a chisel, and a chisel is a uh, literally um, uh, equivalent of the of the compiler um, uh, in the software. And um, and uh, it has uh, two components, which is uh, chisel language and uh, chisel front end and the fertile layer uh, that can actually emit uh, synthesized uh, uh, synthesized uh, um, design for various various uh, targets like FPGA, ASIC, uh, etc. So so the the interesting thing in, in chisel is that hardware design is actually done in the high-level languages, that, which are based on Scala and Scala extensions. Uh, but still, it's actually compiled into Verilog, into the Verilog toolchain is further compiled, compiled into actual hardware. So these are, these are the, the foundational tools that make this happen. Another one that's uh, very powerful is Fuse SOC. Similarly, like like uh, like Verilator, it uh, it pre pre exists before the Chips Alliance, but it's actually used uh, in in uh, almost all Chips Alliance SOC projects, and uh, provides a very powerful tool for quick uh, uh, design of SOCs and reliable reuse of uh, of IP. So so I'm going to actually stop there. Maybe maybe. Um, maybe put uh, put this slide as a background and uh and i'm uh, ready to take some questions okay thank you um i have to say i didn't see uh, a new question pop up uh, at this point in the chat uh, but maybe let's invite the other uh the other panelists who are still with us uh oh i'm sorry i'm sorry we are not on the question part. We are now uh, going to the to Kalista's presentation. Um, so we will take questions after uh, after Kalista's presentation, which we are going just to you know she pre-recorded it, so we are going to see it now, and then we will go back to the questions if that's okay. Okay, Great. thank you. Hi, I'm Kalista Redmond, CEO of Risk Five International, and I'm here to share with you a little bit about our journey and how to engage with us as well as bring you up to date on all the latest things going on across the RISC-V community. First, let's just check in on an incredibly important fact. Success is not sustainable if it's done in isolation. Success requires the collaboration and the input and the stakeholders around the solution. You know, there may be uh, one hit wonders that do appear successful in isolation, but I promise you throughout time, throughout history, sustainable success relies completely on the collaboration. And I will go further to say in technology, software, hardware, tools, resources, open source has now become the fundamental base building block of the success that we see across the industry. So let's think about this. What does the open era of computing mean in the semiconductor space? Well, RISC-V is leading this initiative and we are seeing that through open collaboration, we are enabling a completely fundamental game change across the semiconductor industry. This enables design freedom and flexibility across domains and industries that has not been seen across time. This collaboration, this open approach is cementing the future for the next era of open computing. And we're seeing this at scale. Why? Why is RISC-V so disruptive? Well, it's two things. 
First, it's technology, and second, it's business. But let's talk about technology first. Risk V is fundamentally a small and compact base ISA, 47 base instructions. That is so much easier to work with than 1,500 base instructions that you see in legacy architectures. They didn't all start this way, but they got there through the incremental additional extensions that are added onto a base. Risk v has taken the approach to freeze the base, to keep it small, easy to manage, which helps a lot when you get to power consumption and other variables. And upon that base, you can add the extensions that you require, a truly modular ISA, rather than the incremental approach that has been the stalwart of the industry. Second, we are allowing absolute design freedom. Pick and choose only those aspects that you need rather than be burdened with everything. This is growing rapidly. This design flexibility is at the right inflection point for the business opportunities that our industry is seeing. The business model is disrupted too. Not only are there no IP licensing constraints, there are no boundaries put on the designs that you may uh, pursue. This opens up incredible opportunity. And I'm not just talking about where you can take your products, but the partners that you can collaborate with across industries and around the world in the design and development of your solution. This expands your markets, expands your opportunity, expands the solutions and adjacent spaces you can take your risk by solution. Beyond just taking these barriers down, risk five is at the forefront of building and growing and seizing market opportunities. And this is being reflected by analysts far and wide as we look at the opportunities in front of us. First, 50 billion connected and IoT devices are forecast by 2030. We're almost there already. We're about halfway there. Uh, and you're going to continue to see this uh, growth across the next 10 years. This is explosive growth, not just in enterprise, but especially in home, interconnected home. It ranges from your refrigerator to your wearable. Across PCs and smartphones are also adding a boost to this. And I will say that automotive is one of the fastest growing segments that we're seeing. This has incredible potential for risk five. In fact, Semico put this research report out a few years ago and they said only 62 billion risk five cores by 2025. That number has already jumped. In their latest report just this last March, they're forecasting nearly 80 billion risk five cores by 2025. I will say we are well on our way to this target already. This is a 100, nearly 115% kegger from 2020 to 2025. In five years, you can't argue with that kind of growth. This will compose nearly or over 14% of the overall CPU core market. This is already seeing traction. We are already seeing this today. In fact, last November, Wilson Research found that nearly a quarter of ASIC and FPGA projects already incorporate RISC-V, nearly a quarter. I will contend that no ISA has grown this fast in the history of computing. It's not just the ISA, it's not just the hardware, the IP market, the software and the tools and the additional ecosystem that surrounds RISC-V is also seeing rapid growth. This is at 54%, but watch this space, see where you can engage and where you can get involved. That IP is coming from new designs, new ways of going after new parts of this market. And that market is growing across cloud and data centers, other scale out implementations that uh, where providers are looking to leverage AI and machine learning to really gain competitive advantage. This is being seen in, seen in automotive. I mentioned Semico saw this as the fastest growing segment and it's more than 200% between 2020 and 2025. This is based on safety, security, other critical features that go into a car from, you know, how, from whether or not the car stops to, you know, what's playing on the radio. 
Industrial IoT is continuing to grow in the small, compact, efficient designs that uh, look for great power efficiency and a small envelope, mobile and wireless. The more you ask of your phone, the more processing power it needs and the more cores it's, that it are required. This is continuing to grow generation after generation. And as I mentioned, IoT consumer level is continuing to grow as well as memory and storage. This is one of the largest fields that we see growth in for RISC-V. RISC-V International, our community, is continuing to grow very rapidly. In fact, in 2020, we grew 133%. Already this year, we have already doubled our membership. This is an incredible testament of the amount of investment that is coming into Risk Five and the amount of opportunity that our members are seizing. We see a span of uh, participation across nearly 70 countries. It's important for us to continue our steadfast focus on technical work, technical work that matters, not just for making cool things, but that underpins the strategic foundation for the future of RISC-V. Around this, it's important that we have numerous ways to engage, numerous ways that we RISC-V support the commercial success and industry success of our members. And you'll see us running development partners, risk five labs, development board programs, as well as uh, working together with others in the community through alliances we have together with CHIPS Alliance, as well as security with global platforms and about two dozen other alliances. This innovation roadmap is, it has a foundation in technical deliverables. Everything below the timeline you see, these are the technical deliverables that we have uh, on track or have delivered since uh, the ISA was defined in the early 2010s. This is also uh, continuing to proliferate the programs and the support that we have for industry adoption. This ranges from AI special interest groups and graphic special interest groups, Android special interest groups, uh, HPC, uh, and other types of programs that we are continuing to proliferate across the industry. This is not uh, done in isolation. We are also continuing to work with the software uh, ecosystem and other aspects that are essential, are critical to designing processors that stand the test of time. You'll see on this map that we engage uh, across various technical aspects and up through the stack into software through to specific industry type applications. These are incredibly important alliances that Risk 5 International fosters for and on behalf of our community, such that we work in concert with one another, that we upstream wherever possible and that we elicit the best contributions to stand that test of time. This industry progress is already being reflected. We see accelerators uh, being delivered by the European Processor Initiative. The European Processor Initiative, as well as the European community, has quickly embraced RISC-V as the foundation for processors and uh, engaging deeply and in investing in digital sovereignty for Europe. The RIOS Lab, a uh, collaboration between Tsinghua University and uh, Berkeley, has continued to progress, bringing out a small board computer. And we see additional progress being made throughout our uh, membership from Alibaba on cloud and edge servers to Andes with Superscalar Multicore, uh, Sci-Fi with a personal computer and more. This dedicated community would not be here if we did not engage with the stakeholders all around the solution, from students to multinationals, uh, across industries from embedded to HPC in services and fab and design services, as well as IO, memory storage, uh, software, and of course, with our independent uh, engineers and developer community, press analysts and universities. We have made incredible progress together. Whether it's our 60 plus uh, risk five work groups, our labs and development partners, more than 300 solutions uh, posted on our website, uh, 31 different local community organizations attracting more than 6,000 engineers uh, and continued engagement 
as we look to continue fostering risk five, we are supporting and sponsoring six different programs to ensure our member success. First, technical deliverables, delivering on what matters, test suites and compliance and verification, visibility to amplify the news and information that's relevant to our market, learning and talent to see the industry with talent that is tuned to risk five, advocacy, whether it's our ambassadors or our alliances, and providing a marketplace exchange for all things risk five. I am excited to be here and to share this message with you. Thank you so much for including me in your program. And please visit us online at risk5.org. Follow us on Twitter, on LinkedIn, and on WeChat. We are there for you. Thank you. Okay, so we heard from Kalista and, you know, she talked a lot about the sort of complexity of the community, but also on the business case for uh, for Risk Five and uh, and also other other solutions uh, and products within the open source hardware uh, ecosystem. So I would like to uh, invite Zvonimir and Andrew again on screen. Uh, if you can just uh, share your video again, there is the, the button that you can click there. Um, so we'll be able to, to tackle the, the last question that we saw in the chat. Okay, and you, you also have to click unmute yourself. Perfect, Andrew and Zvonimir is still getting there. Yes, All right, perfect. Great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, maybe maybe let's tackle this uh, this question that we have in the chat because I think this is quite. Uh, I mean, it would be great to have Javier on board as well, uh, but I know that we have some people in the audience who are working a bit more on the on the public sector side, on the more university side. Um, I'm just going to read read that with the question, so we are on the on the same page. Um, so it's a question from uh, somebody who works uh, in a university tech transfer office, and the question, the concern is that uh, my university, as a public institution, has no visibility for the value it contributes to generate, and of course does not share revenues deriving from the products services developed by companies. And the wonder is if there is any way to capture the value that is uh, produced within universities or public sector initiatives. Uh, I don't know who would like to go first, uh, if you have uh, any thoughts on that. Um, I'm happy to kick off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, Alessandra, thank you very much for that question. Um, it, it, it's an excellent question. Uh, and I think you've really sort of captured the, the core of it um, in that the, the problem is that um, it, there is no visibility to the value that's contributed. Um, so we know um, as a result of the um, study that we've just uh, done done with our uh, OFE that value has been created. There's no question about that. And I think, um, um, you know, it's important, particularly in the world of open hardware, that more research is done so that we can actually quantify that and in some ways that you know should be straightforward because especially if you're talking about I mean, in the software world we talk about public money public code um, if universities are, pub are funded by public money then that means it's logical that their outputs um, uh, should also be be made public and if we happen to know that public code is something that generates value for the entire community then that should be end of the story but of course it's not as simple as that uh, because it's a lot easier to claim that um, a, a department a university an organization an individual is successful if they can say I've just received a check for a million euros um, rather than saying you know I, I've increased the value of the economy by five million euros um, so there's definitely some work that, that's that's uh, being done in those areas but in terms of specifically capturing value uh, this is where um, Javier really has a lot to say uh, so I don't want to sort of try, try to try to second guess um, what um, he, he would say uh, but there are you know a number of mechanisms that um, already exist in the world of, um, of, of open source software um, and um, you know we've heard about the blue hat model which is basically similar to the the, the, uh, the, the red hat model and I think that's potentially uh, very powerful as well so from the university's perspective I think uh, the key is to try to nurture a community um, around that particular product and then uh, nurture um, a set of commercial partners who are operating around it um, and then come up with a business model where it's those commercial partners that are commercializing that particular uh, piece of open hardware um, but that there's um, a, a sort of flow of value back to the university in terms of the fact that the university's relationship with those partners can continue to provide commercial value to the partners um, in terms of co continuing collaboration providing expertise um, possibly even lending the name of the university or the name of the uh, of, of the project as well um, so I think 
I think there are there are mechanisms um, that, that that can be applied, but in the world of open hardware, we're still sort of feeling our way to a degree. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Andrew. It sounds like it's the the question of maturity, which uh, comes up a lot when we talk about hardware, especially in in the context of uh, sort of learning from from the software space. I know, Zvonimir, if you have any thoughts on this from the more yeah, uh, yeah from the I, other I, side. I do. I do. There's there's two angles on this question. Number one angle is right in, in your in your domain of expertise, uh, which is policy. What what exactly should be the what exactly should be the policies for universities if they are publicly funded, and and if they're receiving funding from uh, governmental organizations, you you could argue that the benefit then should be for the whole community. Uh, uh, of course, the, this is not the case. There's plenty of universities, especially in the United States. Uh, that actually do derive significant uh, uh, revenues from IP licensing, and that's completely okay as well. Um, I, I, I would say I would say that uh, what applies for the companies uh, could equally well apply for the university. I see a piece of open source uh, IP as an attractor that brings different parties together, and uh, on top of that, uh, which is a common denominator for different kinds of projects. Uh, and that can be used as a base for building proprietary IP extension uh, or, or services. And uh, it, it, it's kind of difficult to see university, you know, taking these corporate things like services and support. But, but uh, definitely, uh, uh, a university can also release, you know, open source component with an intent to sort of uh, create a, a value adds that's built on top of it. So. So I, I don't I don't see I don't see a significant difference there between a un, un, uh, company uh, which needs to make money somehow uh, and a university that would like to generate uh, uh, revenue. Mm -hmm. uh, assuming you... it agrees with public policies, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, and I think it's it's very different yeah. in Europe and in the US. I mean, you know, just the way the universities work. But do you actually think that this is sort of similar in any case of innovation? Because you know, here we talk about you know produ producing innovation. So maybe the case is that it's actually quite similar. You know, it's just in the in a slightly different realm. And you know, okay, we can talk that it's more complex. But I mean, all the innovation is complex. So is that similar to other innovations in other sectors? Yes, I, I agree. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, uh, Alessandro, I hope that uh, this answered your question. Um, I think indeed it would be great to still have Javier on board, who who would be able to uh, to really answer this uh, this question from you know yeah. the, the more personal perspective. Um, but as we are running a bit out of time, I would like to ask uh, one more question to both to both of you. Uh, and then we can uh, we can con conclude the event. Um, so it's sort of you know the future outlook. You know what you what do you think is necessary to happen for open hardware and sort of in the in the realm of policies? What kind of support do you think would be beneficial? And for what particular sectors or types of companies or types of uh, research institutes or types of collaboration? Just like what would you like to see in the next five years? Let's say ten years. Uh, maybe let's start with uh, with Zvonimir. You are uh, just you know next to me on the on the screen. Oh, <laughs> uh, I think uh, I think for the next uh, five years, I'm uh, uh, I'm hoping to to further extend the openness of the toolchain. I think uh, when the toolchain needed for hardware design is an open source uh, that uh, that really creates inc incredible platform for innovation um, uh, because uh, uh, one of the one of the obstacles to open open source uh, hardware innovations was that uh, whenever proprietary uh, tool chains were used they were adding IP into the flow and and effectively effectively preventing the sharing of, uh, of some of the outputs so that that's something that that we are hoping to develop uh, in, in the next five years. We we already have Open Road as a project in in Chips Alliance, uh, and we hope to continue growing and fostering it to to uh, to enable that. And we also think that this is going to be an amazing tool for for legal innovations as well, because I think once the legal arms realize, aha, uh -huh, okay, so this is how things work now in five years from today. Uh, we will then see, you know, what where the where the possibilities are. Okay, thank you, uh, Andrew. 
Um, I, I agree with all of that. Um, and I think what, what's interesting is that um, because a lot of what Svanamir was talking about is um, very similar to the way that open source software has become so successful. Um, and we already have um, you know, plenty of examples of that out there. Industry understands the power behind it. Um, I think a lot of what Svanamir was saying is actually inevitable. Um, and you can almost argue that um, you know, we, we don't need too much in the way of policy to make that happen because it might happen already. But of course, we, 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 we're talking specifically um, about the, the, uh, the softer end of the hardware spectrum. I don't think that's necessarily going to be true. Um, uh, you know, it'd be very interesting if, um, if you know, somebody did, did um, come up with an open source um, suspension component for a car, for example, uh, whether that's something that is, that is ever going to happen, sort of mechanical designs. Um, and um, uh, that's still seen as being sort of very much the, the sort of the hobbyist end um, mm -hmm. of the uh, of, of the industry, there's plenty of stuff going on, and there was a lot of really good stuff going on around medical devices with COVID, etc. And I've been involved in a, uh, in, in, a, in a in a number of initiatives. So I think what 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 we really need to do is to to look at the the areas of open hardware, uh, because anything that benefits open source software from a policy perspective is likely to benefit the softer end of open hardware as well. The idea of setting up open source program offices, for example, is is a great one, because it basically gives organisations permission to to do that. It's no longer a weird thing to do working in open source software, um, and it and therefore it won't be a weird thing to do to work in open source hardware where, when you're looking at the software end. What's what's a lot more interesting um, to me is uh, whether we can move uh, into the, the the area of the sort of the, the harder ends of, of hardware, the sort of the 3D printing um, and the mechanical devices and so on, and whether we can get the same sort of dynamics to happen there. And that's when we start to talk about things like um, intellectual property, uh, which is, you know, a bit too complicated at the moment. There aren't, um, it, and it varies very significantly from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So uh, there's a lack of certainty there, which can cause, cause, cause problems. Um, and also the regulatory regime, because clearly, you know, if you're providing good into the marketplace. Um, on the one hand, you've got to make sure that consumers are protected, and that's um, you know always the case. But it's especially difficult when you're talking about things like medical devices, for example. Uh, but on the other hand, make sure that you're not suppressing innovation or limiting innovation to a small number of organisations by doing that. Um, and I think those are, are really the challenges that I would like the policymakers to to, to look at and to consider. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, Andrew. This is uh, this is very interesting. I don't know if you have any any last words. Uh, just you know, as a uh, as a sum up, uh, but I think this was you know quite a quite an interesting lookout. You know what um, what sh can happen in the next five years or ten years because we've been trying to you know go forward with these discussions for the last one year, two years. Uh, I have to say it's not that easy in the in the policy landscape because it's still again we have these issues of maturity and complexity and quite uh, quite a diverse landscape. Um, but I hope, you know, that uh, we'll have another event like this and then we'll have a bit more of the, you know, research that we can, uh, that we can cite or just a, a bit more policy uh, that we can actually develop or analyze at that point. Uh, so I think, yes, oh, we, okay, we are running out of time, uh, 20 minutes uh, past. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed it. Uh, I learned quite a lot. I hope that our audience as well. Um, we'll have another installment of the open source um, policy uh, policy series. Uh, it will be next week, if I'm not mistaken. Tw no, it will be tw 26th of June. So uh, I hope to see you then. Uh, and thank you. Thanks a lot. Have a nice day and have a nice evening, actually, depending where you are. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.